Hello and welcome to The Next Page, the podcast of the UN Library and Archives Geneva, dedicated to conversations on multilateralism. This is It Takes a Global Crisis, a series of four special episodes in collaboration with the SDG Lab at UN Geneva. Hi, I'm Edward Mashad from the SDG Lab. And we're Tiffany Verga and Natalie Alexander from the Library and Archives. Together, we'll explore how the COVID-19 pandemic has in many ways set in motion sustainable development solutions, things that were often talked about but rarely implemented before the crisis. We'll also consider the challenges, the gaps, and the limitations of progress that the pandemic has highlighted. We'll be talking to a range of experts and practitioners as they work both on the ground and in advancing policy on their experiences across the themes of digitalization and connectivity, the environment as a key to resilience, sustainable cities, and social protection. At the end of each episode, we'll also share with you a spark, an idea from a real-life project relevant to the episode's theme that is sparking change to advance the SDGs. So, did it take a global crisis? Let's find out. Hi everyone, it's Edward here with the SDG Lab, and I'd like to welcome you to our first episode in this new podcast mini-series between the SDG Lab, where I work, and the UN Library and Archives here in Geneva. In this episode, we will be discussing connectivity and digitalization for the Sustainable Development Goals, or the SDGs. And this is a huge topic, and it's really one that we could devote an entire podcast to. But for today, we would like to dive deeper into the impact of COVID-19 on connectivity and digitalization through the lens of the SDGs to see whether progress has been accelerated or disadvantaged due to the pandemic. It was difficult for us that we're fortunate enough to have access to connectivity, but what we really saw in somewhat of a shocking way was what that meant to those that actually didn't have access to connectivity. That's Doreen Bogdan Martin. She's the director of the Telecommunication Development Bureau at the ITU. I must say that for a country like Niger or many African countries, it has helped us actually being more focused on what is essential citizens and then service delivery to the people wherever they are. And that's Ibrahima Gumba Saidu. He is the Director General of the National Agency for the Information Society of Niger, and he's also the former Minister and Special Advisor of the President of the Republic of Niger. They both join me in discussing this topic and sharing their insights from their own perspectives. As a team, we thought it would be amiss to not comment on some of the audio and connection challenges heard throughout this episode. While we could not address it and really hope you don't notice, this is just another reflection of the scope of internet connectivity across the world. And one of the reasons the advancement of connectivity is so crucial and central to achieving the SDGs. So without further ado, we hope you enjoy this episode. So let's get into it. I just wanted to start us off maybe first, Doreen, to you, and this is just probably just a terminology check. Is there a difference between digitalization and digitization? We sometimes hear these two words used interchangeably. So I'm wondering if you can just briefly shed a little bit of light on that. Well, thank you so much, Edwards, and it's, it's great to be here on such uh, an important topic. And as you mentioned, uh, COVID has, let's say, put the focus, the spotlight, connectivity. I think connectivity has, uh, has been the game-changing moment for connectivity. So digitization versus digitalization is the question. You know, I think they can be used interchangeably. I think, you know, we we look at this in terms of a process that countries can take to digitize services in terms of whole of government. Maybe Ibrahima will, will touch on that in a moment. But I think what's important to focus on really is access to digital, because without access, digitization versus digitalization it doesn't matter. And I think it, it's important in terms of context setting to remember that today, 3.7 billion people don't have access to digital. They don't have mm. access to connectivity, so they can't benefit from digital services and applications. Well, thanks for that, Doreen. And you just touched upon it, but maybe if you can elaborate a bit more, 
you know, how has the, the COVID-19 pandemic changed connectivity and, and access to digital tools and content and really what's possible through these, these technologies? So COVID-19 has really been an accelerator for digitalization or digital applications and, and services. And it's also been a wake-up call for governments and for society as a whole that, as I mentioned, 3.7 billion people, which is half of humanity, has no access to digital tools and services. And of course, when COVID hit and lockdowns began, practically overnight, people were forced to work from home, shop from home, learn from home. And of course, it was difficult for us that we're fortunate enough to have access to connectivity. But what we really saw in somewhat of a shocking way was what that meant to those that actually didn't have access to connectivity. So I think it, it really has been a big wake-up call. And it's been a moment where governments and society as a whole has actually understood that connectivity is no longer something that's nice to have. It's actually something that's essential. It's essential for our lives as we move into this new normal post-COVID, uh, that connectivity is here to stay. And so we need to find ways to, to bridge the digital divide. I think also COVID has, I mentioned it's been an accelerator. I think it has pushed countries, I would say both developed and developing, to quickly streamline processes and bring digital services online. Things that might have taken months, years to happen happen very quickly because governments needed to get e-government services out to their populations. Digital financial services were rolled out quickly in countries that didn't have those kinds of services. And so we quickly saw governments kind of fast-paced, normal, long processes so that they could actually get the services to their populations that were stuck at home, basically. We saw lots of great innovation in the space of healthcare, e-health. We saw lots of, of course, great things happening in terms of e-learning. Big challenges still remain there, but I would say for the most part, we, we saw lots of acceleration, lots of innovation. We saw governments using previously unused universal service funds to find ways to actually get connectivity to those that didn't have it, and of course find ways to actually keep those connected connected, because of course the network experienced huge surges in, in traffic, and fortunately our sector managed to withstand those uh, huge surges. And Doreen, do you think, I mean, you've talked about this acceleration that we're seeing. So is this, from your perspective and from ITU's perspective, is this being translated into the impact for the SDGs and acceleration of the SDGs? So, of course, COVID has set us back in terms of progress. We saw that very clearly in the SDG progress report over the summer. It's had a huge impact on the world as a whole, on every single SDG. So it has set us back. But at the same time, it has exposed a number of opportunities, and it's made pretty clearly the case of how digital technologies and connectivity can actually play a huge role in achieving each and every one of those SDGs and hopefully get us back on track. I do think we can get back on track, but if we don't get digital out to the masses, I think it's going to be very difficult to achieve those SDGs. And Ibrahim, I'd like to turn to you. I think this is a nice transition to bring you into the conversation. From your perspective, and just reflecting on what Doreen just shared, in Niger, what are you seeing play out uh, at country level or even if you can speak to it as well across the African continent in terms of developments, accelerations that we're seeing because of COVID-19 and this fast switch to providing services, but at the same time looking at this massive digital gap that Doreen also mentioned earlier. Thank you for having me also. It's really a pleasure to to be part of this series that you're starting. For us in Niger, it's probably the case for many African countries. Overall, that really, it's sad to say it has helped us uh, big time, so to speak, because what uh, COVID has brought really to the table is that all we're doing is about people. We have to focus on people, on the citizens, and we have to focus on delivering services to them. 
And so countries like Niger, who are, let's say, on the other side of the spectrum when it comes to uh, the various uh, development index, index, have until now uh, really struggled in trying to address those uh, many challenges alone in a sort of standalone basis. And COVID has just, let's say, bring that out, showing us that we need to talk to some people and then have a sort of combo approach. It's all about citizens, it's all about service delivery. And the only way really we could, could leverage in uh, uh, trying to address those is and has been digital. Maybe fortunately for us, I mean, we have started that uh, exercise. With the help of ITU, actually, Doreen has been a, a great supporter. Already trying to see how we could do things differently um, because we, when you look at, let's say, the, the, the telecom or the digital environment in Niger, it wasn't at the level we expected it to be. So we were in the middle of that exercise when COVID-19 uh, pandemic actually has come. And so we just had to accelerate that. And I, I don't know in the rest of the continent, but probably in, uh, in Africa, at least in Niger, there have really been two uh, sort of ministries that have been uh, exposed uh, during that pandemic. Ministry of Health, of course, and then the telecom sector. Because all of a sudden, uh, we were faced with a situation where we had to make sure that citizens have access to services, as I mentioned. Uh, initially, of course, uh, access to health care and then um, all those actions taken by the government you know, to, uh, to fight COVID, but subsequently to also have access to services uh, that's going to help at least the, uh, some part of the population and get by. And we, we only had telecom or ICT actually to, to use, so it has exposed us big time. And it has uh, helped actually the country really rally behind that idea that we have to connect them connected, as uh, Dorian was mentioning. We were having so many reasons not to, that when you know, in the middle of the pandemic, you know, we had no other choice uh, but to, to say, uh, listen, we, we, have to, we have to do it anyway. So it has brought a sort of new, new era in the country in terms of mindset. I must say that for a country like Niger or many African countries, it has helped us actually being more focused on what is a chance, a essential citizens and then service delivery to the people wherever they are. And they insist on the wherever because uh, before the pandemic, we were just focusing on the main cities, usually just the capital city, which has great connection, but the rest of the country was connected. And now we are all working day and night to try to balance that sort of bridge and balance, you know, between the major cities and the rest of the country. And Ibrahim, I, I guess that's a good way to also ask you about, you know, how can this type of momentum be continued? And I know that you've mentioned this in previous talks that you've also given around the importance of enabling environment. So how can we go from the current state that we are in now to ensure that this change that you've talked about in Niger will continue and that we do not lose the advances that have been made in the last uh, 18 to 20 months. So I think that's what we're trying to do in Niger, but again, that's, uh, I guess, uh, uh, similar everywhere. We have learned our lessons, right? So it's really clear that we need to work as a team. So from the government side, it's really one government approach that need to continue. And we have seen that it can work. People can put you know, some differences aside and then focus on really what matters. So that has to be maintained. We need to do the same with our international and uh, development partners. So both from the private sector and then from uh, the NGOs or, or public sectors, international organizations. We have seen also that in terms of crisis, it becomes smarter. So those sort of working uh, work groups or uh, initiatives that we have started, I think we need to find a way to formalize those, to have some sort of really strong advisory boards that are going to make sure that, you know, we continue on that path, that we also maybe put down in place the right measurement, that everything that we do remain focused again on, on people, on citizens. And I'd like us to focus also on the telecom side, not from the telecom only perspective. So we definitely need the, the infrastructure. Uh, we need to, and we need that big time, but we need to focus on the combination of that and the service uh, delivery. And for me, it can only be done 
if we work as a team. Uh, there is an expression that I like to use, a sort of carpooling for development approach that I like to call it, because we all need to be on that same car, on that same bus, and then drive in the same direction, which is you know the direction uh, towards you know people. And uh, that way we can have that combo of connectivity and service delivery. So Doreen, building on what uh, Ibrahim had just shared, I think that goes really into my next question, which from your perspective, what are the, the different enablers or shall we say levers that a government should consider when wanting to use connectivity and digital services to help implement the SDGs? Well, I love the carpooling yeah. <laughs> analogy. It's very visual. For everybody getting on the same bus, I think that's definitely where governments need to be focusing. And so we call it the whole of government approach. So it's not viewing connectivity as something that's of scope for just the telecom ministry. It's actually looking at connectivity and digital issues that cut across all sectors of the economy. And so, you know, everybody needs to be in the same car, share the car or on the same bus. And that's how I think I think we can get it done. And of course, you know, that's the kind of enabling policy and regulatory framework that we need to be driving. And if you put in place the right framework, a framework that's agile, a framework that's flexible, that will ultimately attract the needed investment. So we estimate half the world not connected, as I mentioned, and that would take somewhere in the nature of 400 and close to $30 billion. And that's just the infrastructure piece. So how can you attract that investment? Well, the enabling framework is absolutely a critical piece. And of course, to get that investment, we need to be a bit creative. We need innovative models of, of financing to attract that investment. Because without that investment, we're not going to have the infrastructure. And of course, if, if you don't have the infrastructure, then we're not going to get the connectivity out there and we're not going to be able to help achieve those SDGs. I think it's also important to consider issues linked to affordability of services and devices. So once you get that, um, that signal out there, you need to make sure that people can actually connect to it. And they can connect to it if it's, of course, affordable. In many countries, affordability is a huge issue on the device and the service side. And, of course, once you get that device and service out there, you need to make sure people can actually use it. Because connectivity is useless unless you actually have the skills to be able to use it in a way that's empowering and life-changing. So I think the basic digital literacy and those digital skills are so important in order to be able to leverage the power and the potential of connectivity. I think we can't ignore safety and security issues. We've seen uh, a big rise, in particular, when we look at young people, at children that came online during the pandemic, perhaps earlier than their parents would have wanted. And so sort of the rise in bullying and, and harassment is an issue. So again, when we think about the factors to be considered, we have to make sure that we work harder to have a safer cyberspace, a trusted a cyberspace. I think that's also critical. And then the other piece that I think that cannot be ignored, um, and Ibrahima touched on this as well, it's what do you get with that connectivity? So you have the skills, but what do you get? And that's very focused on the needs of the people, going back to Ibrahima's focus on the people, which I absolutely agree with. So it's the content that communities need, and is that content applicable to the needs of, of, of the local populations? Is it accessible in local languages so that it can be used in ways that are beneficial? So I think that the content creation piece is also a critical factor. And then, of course, the last thing I would mention, which might be actually the most important, it's the, the commitment. So the, this is linked to the whole of government approach, but before you get there, you actually have to have that political will and that political commitment at the highest level. And I do think that the pandemic has helped those of us that have been working in this sector for many, many years, and we haven't seen the commitment there. Uh, ICT was always at the bottom of the priority list, and we're finally seeing that move up to the top and the, the, the political commitment actually being put in place and happening. 
as we move beyond the pandemic, we need to make sure that it stays as a top priority because should another pandemic or other disaster hit us, we need to be better prepared than we were this time around. Doreen, you've touched upon an interesting word just now around creativity when you were talking about some of the the mindset and also the the practical elements that are required for governments. And you mentioned also the the price tag that's attached to to ensure, I guess, global connectivity in, in all parts of the world. And linked to that, you've spoken in the past about collaboration. And I think that's, you know, an important enabler of connectivity. And you, you recently said that connectivity is the thread that ties all of the, the SDGs together. Can you explain a little bit more what you, you meant by that? Sure. Well, when the SDGs were being debated, there were many of us that argued that connectivity or information and communication technologies should actually be a goal in and of itself. We called it SDG 18. Some people now call it SDG zero, so sort of the hole in the donut that actually links to every single SDG. Whether it would have been a separate goal or not, I think the issue that's pretty clear today is that it is that thread that can tie the whole SDG circle together. I am more and more convinced that it will be impossible to achieve any of the goals unless we find ways to leverage digital technology. So it goes back to closing the digital divide and the other enablers that go with it that will help us to pick up from the time we lost during this pandemic and and really advance and accelerate towards achieving each and every one of the 17 goals and the numerous associated targets. I think it can be done, but it can only be done if we collaborate. I think when we look at the cost, just on the connectivity piece and the infrastructure, it's not going to be a single government. It's not going to be a single company. It's not going to be a single UN organization. It needs to be all of us really working hand in hand to get it done. And I think this has been an important moment for the UN system as a whole. Of course, we just saw the UN Secretary General launch his common agenda where he highlights the six great divides, and he calls them the six Grand Canyons. Of course, one of those huge divides is is digital and connectivity. And, of course, he sees that interspersed with the five other divides, one of which is also gender. We could talk at great length Mm. about the, the digital gender gap, which is also something of great concern. But I do think it's an important moment for all stakeholders, including a civil society, academia, to come together and figure out, you know, how can we connect the world so that we ultimately build a shared digital future for all and that the future can be sustainable. And I think it's all about collaboration and strong partnerships. And if I can just uh, briefly mention, next year for us is an important year in the ITU because we have our World Telecommunications Development Conference that will take place in June 2022. And that's an important conference because it sets out the roadmap for the next four-year period. And I think this conference has the potential to go down as a landmark conference for digital development because we've never had such political focus and attention on the connectivity issues. And I think that it's the moment that countries want to move beyond long resolutions and actually focus on concrete actions that will connect the furthest out, the last mile, and actually bring meaningful connectivity to all. Now, I, I want to come back to that in a, in a second, Doreen, also, because uh, you've talked about you know, the next five years, and I think that's an important looking forward piece. But Ibrahim, I'd like to, to come back to you and just building now on Doreen's point around connectivity and, and empowering communities. You, you spoke about it earlier, talked about this acceleration of e-services and also in, within even government. Those that in the past were probably not even on board all of a sudden overnight or in a short time frame became very much supportive of connectivity and, and digital technologies for citizens. So, you know, concretely, what do you see as, as some of the, the tangible benefits that you've experienced in your work in Niger in terms of expanding access to connectivity to communities and to citizens? And as Doreen said, it's ultimately about empowering communities. Well, I mean, definitely. I mean, that's, I mean, that's it. It's really empowering even citizens, actually, for that matter. And for us, I mean, based on, on what I've indicated before, the, 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 that's really a need to, to focus on citizens has 
has been and is still what is driving us. So what we have been doing is to find a way to reach out to all those communities by bringing, connecting all remote uh, Places, for example, we have this uh, program called Smart Village, which actually speaks to really expanding infrastructure. We need to have people across, you know, all over the country actually being connected and being really linked, not only to uh, management of a country, but also being linked to the world. And but we have do we have been doing it. I was going to say maybe a smart way. That's what I indicated earlier. Uh, COVID has made us smarter. And so by pushing us really to see how we can optimize the little resources that we have and how we can get actually also communities involved. So we are, the way we're addressing that is by empowering those communities, making them really take full ownership of the initiative that we're doing. On the Smart Village, the pilot, for example, that we, we are running and we're also in collaboration with ITU, has done that. We send people on the, in those villages, talk to the populations, uh, understand their really needs, and then that's only when we brought the connectivity and then have services delivered around those needs. And the benefit is that we sure that the connectivity that we're bringing is actually used for the good of the community. So that's why maybe the biggest thing that we have on our agenda is what I'll call even true digital literacy. What I mean by that. It's not just to, to create the capability of being able to be on social media and, and, and others. No, it is really to uh, train uh, citizens so that they can use digital to perform a specific expertise that they want. A farmer has to be fully uh, what you call it, trained in such a way that he can acquire new competencies, he can run his farm, he can run his business, on the, on the digital world. That's what I mean by making sure that there is really true digital literacy. And from the government side also, we need to do exactly the same. For example, now when we even talk about you know, security, which is a big challenge in, in the Sahel region, as you know it, one of the first things that come in the conversation is, is a digital, is connectivity, is also bringing the citizens into the equation. So for us, that's, let's say, the environment that we're putting in place having that connectivity, getting citizens uh, fully engaged. And I indicated earlier also that we are a very young country. So it has helped us also look at, let's say, the landscape. Uh, for example, in the, education, in the education sector, we are now working on bringing digital into education, into both primary, secondary, and, and higher education. So which means, beside the connectivity itself, we're looking at a new curriculum. And we're looking at also through capacity building. So the curriculum is really being looked at again in such a way that is going to enable most people who will go through it to be able to find employment or to be able to at least set up and create their own business instead of having them just sit and waiting, you know, for a job to come and find them. And I guess just thinking in terms there's so many different different points that we can continue to pack here. But the next question, I want to actually pose this to, to both of you. And Doreen, I'll start with you. So when we look at the future, and what do you see, Doreen, as some of the, the big challenges? You, you briefly touched upon safety and security, but what other areas do you think that really need to be taken into account as we look forward? And, and also, how do we build that into the, the timeline of the SDGs to bring us to, to 2030. So as we think about the future and we think about the challenges, I think it's great to look at the, the case that Ibrahima has just presented, mm. the case of Niger, the youngest uh, population on the planet, and how Niger took a challenge and turned it into an opportunity. I mean, I think that's a great example that can be modeled by others because when we look at connectivity and digital issues, there are huge challenges, but at the same time, we can overcome them and turn them into, into opportunities. Of course, we have last-mile connectivity issues, and we have situations where, of course, there's no electricity, and how do you get connectivity to those where they don't have electricity? And I think the good news is that we're seeing so much innovation, so many new things coming out of, of the sector, new technologies, new low-Earth orbiting systems that actually can remove previous technological barriers 
so that we can bring connectivity to everyone everywhere. I think the challenge about financing can't be underestimated. Uh, we recently had work done by the Broadband Commission for Sustainable Development on 21st century financing. I think we have to do more work in looking at things like universal service funds, universal access funds. How can they be used to get connectivity to the unconnected communities? Can we look at expanding the pool of those that contribute to last mile connectivity? Should we be considering creating a sort of international fund? With UNICEF, uh, the ITU has this GIGA program to connect every school on the planet. And in that context, we're looking at a connectivity bond uh, so I think on the financing front, business as usual is not going to cut it. So we need to do uh, more because that is a challenge that we have to we have to tackle. And Ibrahima, I think Doreen nicely mapped out some of the challenges. And maybe this question to you then, maybe not on the on the challenges, but what about the the additional possibilities that that you see? F- from where you are, your perspective, and especially if we think of the fact that there's this extremely young population in Niger. So what to you kind of stand out as the most impactful possibilities that we can see through connectivity and digital tools for contributing to the ultimate vision of the SDGs? Before I answer directly to that question, I mean, there is uh, just a, a comment that I'd like to, to make because Dorian mentioned something of uh, interest. I don't know, Dorian, if you remember, there was a young lady from Niger whom you met uh, three years or so ago, Miss Geek Africa. I remember. You remember Latifa? Yes. Uh, so this young girl was the first winner of the national competition on innovation that we organize in Niger, that we have organized in Niger. So she, the first event, she won actually two prizes because at that time we had one prize that was set aside for female, thinking that probably it was going to, the competition was going to be won by a boy. And we had it all wrong. She came, so she, not only she won the national prize, but because there was a prize uh, that was there for, for girls, I mean, she won them both. And then she wants to run down and, and want the, the Miss Geek Africa. So I think in Asia, we learn our lesson, really. Uh, when we saw that, we say, listen, there was no, absolutely no reason for us to discriminate because somehow we discriminate without even knowing it. And we need to make sure that we bring more girls forward because in many cases, actually, they, they're, they're among the best, if not the best. So that really tells you, this for me, how... You know, the perspective that countries like Niger have, a young population, when you give opportunities to those populations, girls or boys, you know, they go even farther than you can think of. And Latifa, for me, is a good example. And COVID has just accelerated that for us because during that time, we have really seen the potential that is within our youth. It is about the brain. So for us, really, the focus is to making sure that those brains have access to knowledge. They have access to information. And then we, that there is really no limit to what they can achieve. Because they are the future of the country. They are the future of the world. So we need to, instead of just saying it, we need to really start putting them forward, creating the environment for them. Doreen, I'd I'd like to come back to you and and maybe just give you then, in this sense, the building on what Ibrahima just mentioned, maybe your last thoughts. I guess I would just sort of stress the importance that the pandemic has had on connectivity. I mean, it took a pandemic to actually make the case for universal, affordable connectivity. Uh, It took a pandemic to put connectivity at the top of national agendas. And, of course, it's regrettable that so many people lost their lives, that lost their jobs, lost opportunities. But this is a moment that we need to capture and move forward and ensure that everyone has access to life-saving technologies. And Ibrahima, to you, it took a pandemic to, to what? How would you complete that sentence? Also, it took a pandemic to make us really realize that it's, it's a global, the world is a global village. It took a pandemic to really also make us smarter. 
Uh, and we see, I mean, we, we're coming back to the fundamentals, these are things that we keep saying, but that we forget and that we're not practicing. So we should learn our lesson. We shouldn't forget those. And I think also from just thinking from the SDG Lab, I think from us, it's, it's clear that it took a pandemic to really drive home these essential paradigms of the 2030 agenda. We touched upon collaboration earlier, Doreen. You, you talked about that. We talked about innovation. And we've also really talked about integration, Ibrahima, back to, to the different examples that you shared in Niger. So I think it's really clear that this hunch that we've had, and, and not only us, but uh, despite the, the tragedy and the, the ongoing, to a certain degree, trauma that we're still seeing from the pandemic play out, that we, we do have these, these bright spots that are bringing us uh, hopefully closer to the ideals of the 2030 Agenda and that we see these distinct contributions to the specific goals, like you mentioned, Doreen. Uh, so I think that those are some of the takeaways that I'm going to leave from our, our conversation today. And I really want to thank you both for, for taking the time, for sharing your insights and your knowledge, your ideas, and also your enthusiasm. There are so many different ideas that have come forward. So thank you, and I wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you all. Bye-bye. Welcome to the first Spark. This is a segment of our SDG Lab series where at the end of each episode, we'll explore inspirational stories related to the conversation to spark further understanding and curiosity. Chances are, if you're listening to this episode, you are part of the 51% of the world's population that is connected to the internet. From emails, to social media, to even remote work, you're likely just one button or one call away from anyone at any time. However, while this may be your reality, half of the world remains totally unconnected. Today's case study will introduce you to a solution that is currently aiming to solve that issue. The Smart Village Blueprint is a pilot project led by the International Telecommunication Union, the Digital Impact Alliance, the National Agency for the Information Society of Niger, and Smart Africa. The Blueprint is aiming to provide a broadband infrastructure to improve internet access in rural and remote parts of the country and takes on learnings from other experiences setting up, managing and sustaining similar projects globally. What makes this project specifically unique is its adoption of a smart village. But what is a smart village? A smart village is a community in rural areas that leverages digital connectivity, solutions and resources for its own development and transformation towards achieving the SDGs. Smart villages such as in Niger invites local context into the discussion to build off local strengths and opportunities to develop smart solutions specific to the challenges their communities face. From professionals to students and youth, farmers, women, village leaders and community members, all citizens in a smart village concept are actively involved. Rather than taking a top-down, siloed organisational approach that promotes rigid decision-making. Instead, this project aims to distribute and integrate decision-making and power, a digital approach that is sustainable and adaptable to change. To put it simply, providing connectivity alone to rural areas is only a band-aid solution. Strong leadership, political will and citizen-centred programs will ensure actual sustainable, inclusive and equitable digital services are achieved. Smart villages sound great, but what do they look like? To explain this to you, I'm going to take you to Niger to explore what a network village digital infrastructure could look like under this new blueprint. We start off with a centrally managed server which can provide a common platform to manage all different applications used in the smart village and secure access to service owners, such as ministries of health, education and agriculture as examples. This common platform allows these organisations to easily access and manage their respective applications and reduces maintenance and operational costs. 
This would include a smart village cloud, a low-cost broadband connectivity, local Wi-Fi access points, and a local village server to cache content daily. From this foundation, rural communities can access the internet to benefit their lives. While this is a piloted project, this smart village approach is currently informing other countries in deploying similar techniques and approaches that have the potential to advance sustainable development not only in remote areas of Niger, but globally, providing broadband and internet to millions who are currently offline. To find out more about this interesting approach, check out our show notes where you can read the full blueprint. It Takes a Global Crisis is produced by the UN Library and Archives Geneva and the SDG Lab. The production team is Edward Michard, Marlene Borlon, Yevgenia Otohova, Tiffany Verga, and Natalie Alexander. If you'd like to give us feedback or share your comments, you can email us at sdg-lab at un.org. And don't forget to subscribe rate, leave us a review or find us at UNOG Library on Twitter and New and Library and Archives Geneva on Facebook. Or find us at SDG Lab on Twitter or SDG Lab at UN Geneva on LinkedIn. Thanks for listening. Bye for now.